So uh, with those announcements have been made, I'll make some initial comments uh, as a preface to today's material, and then we'll dive into it. Um, the last set of lectures have explored topics associated with communicable disease modeling, modeling of infectious diseases. And it points to a canon, uh, sort of a very well-established uh, set of understanding about fruitful ways to characterize infectious diseases that use time and time again, certain recurrent patterns, uh, much as in software engineering, we have software patterns. Here we have modeling patterns that are used again and again with processes of contagion. Here we've been focusing our preeminent example on communicable disease transmission, speaking to the pandemic context that surround us, surrounds us. But um, one should be aware that similar mathematics and model structures apply for many other types of contagion, whether it's of rumors, uh, uh, communication of information on social media, diffusion of innovation, or other components. Uh, other sort of similar processes whereby um, uh, one individual or actor might have some piece of information or, or some uh, uh, agent that can be communicated, uh, speaking of agent in a, in a health science sense, uh, uh, some sort of uh, communicable component. And uh, that element that can be communicated is, is spread by a, a contact between those who have it and those who don't. And uh, the processes by which it spreads uh, will depend on, on their particulars on aspects of, of the situation, including, for example, whether infection is permanent um, or short-lived, uh, whether people who are infected earlier uh, can get reinfected again, um, the, the degree to which one actor can expose uh, many parties simultaneously or, or simply one. Think about a difference between coughing in a, in a crowded bus station versus uh, uh, bloodborne infection where someone might uh, uh, share needles with one other person uh, or sexual contact. Uh, and uh, in, in those uh, different cases, it will tend to spread in its particulars uh, in a somewhat different way. But a lot of the same mathematics essentially applies. And we'll see uh, the same phenomenon examined with a different and a more fine-grained lens when it comes to agent-based modeling, where we'll, we'll really break things down to the level of, of the individuals engaged in that contact. And we may examine how certain factors such as the presence of networks, uh, networks of contact, uh, networks of interaction of one sort or another will, will mediate that infection. Space and, and, and location is another factor. But for the models we're looking at, we somewhat abstract over that. And we might say, well, look, we're, we're characterizing spread of infection within a single smaller community um, or a community that's well mixed in the sense that people from one area uh, tend to bump into frequently people from other areas. And uh, even if that's uh, not, detail, not uh, true in all of its details, it may be a good enough approximation. Remember in the very first lecture, I spoke with you about models uh, being like maps. Uh, it's not that they are perfect representations of the world, but rather they're good enough for our purposes. Uh, and in, in this case, the, the model purpose, uh, for example, our, our desire to, to, to characterize, for example, which understand which interventions might be most efficacious uh, it may not matter whether or not we capture the, the vagaries of people's driving behavior and interacting behavior just so much as we, we characterize something about the broad levels of contact across the population. So uh, we've been examining these models of infectious uh, disease uh, propagation spread. And uh, I'm, I need to begin in light of the break uh, by reminding you of a few key essentials of those before we dive into a set of new material. 
uh, where that new material today will focus on the fact that these models as nonlinear models, models where the behavior of a, of a given person over time, the, the probability density that they'll transition from one state to another uh, will depend on uh, other states of the system um, than the other states of the system, for example, the number of infectives. Uh, and we get for compartmental models, this characteristic um, interaction term where S is multiplied by I, for example. Um, so uh, in these cases, uh, we have a, a variety of implications extending from nonlinearity. And one of them is we have multiple equilibria that are typically possible, meaning the system can be in balance in more than one state. And we, we saw a glimpse of that before the break, uh, but we're going to be going into it uh, in more detail today and really exploring what some of these equilibria are for closed populations, open populations, uh, populations where people come in and leave, and populations where there's a circulation of people between states, say people lose immunity. We'll also take a look uh, at the sort of characteristic dynamics which critically involve accumulation, feedbacks, delays, which are all hallmarks of uh, complex systems, um, such as we've been examining, and all captured quite well with these sort of compartmental models, uh, with stocks, uh, for example, uh, playing the role of capturing accumulations and delays, and feedbacks uh, being associated either in a reinforcing or balancing way with the influence of, of a stock ultimately on the flows that, that come into or out of it. So that's our goals. Uh, that's our goal for today. And uh, we'll be expanding on it next time with a discussion of the impact of vaccination. Uh, very timely. Uh, just today, um, I heard formal confirmation of news. I heard from a uh, a well-placed uh, uh, individual within the federal uh, hierarchy who, uh, who communicated the excellent news that uh, uh, even with first doses of vaccination, the, uh, the current vaccines currently being applied to COVID-19 are protective not only against serious disease, but in against infection. Uh, and there's a key difference there because if they weren't effective against infection, just against serious disease, um, we might not see a, a rapid abatement uh, of the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, we're headed towards uh, a summer uh, that will be uh, reminiscent to summers of the past, um, even though the pandemic won't be fully uh, over and a fall that will be characterized by a lot fewer outbreaks than if, if the news had turned out the other way. So um, with that currency in mind, uh, we'll, we'll turn back to these infectious disease models. And to that end, I'm going to begin sharing my screen. Okay, uh, so just again, by way of reminders, we've been dealing with these models which characterize communicable disease and they do so with a set of characteristic parameters. Um, two of the key parameters are given here. One is a contact rate, um, which is a per unit time contact rate. Um, and it's, it's often convenient to treat it as uh, people mixed with per person who's mixing per unit time. And therefore it's of dimension one over time. Um, that will end up being relevant in some of our analysis later. Uh, by contrast, there's also a question of if an infective contacts, indeed contacts is susceptible, what's the probability they'll transmit the infection in that contact? And uh, we treat that as a parameter of beta, which is a probability between zero and one. And we talked about uh, some intuition for a variety of these terms, critically including this force of infection, this, this chance per unit time, so probability density, that a given susceptible will get infected. Um, 
And that force of infection uh, essentially governs the riskiness of the environment for those susceptibles and is a key driver for, for how many susceptibles are, are indeed uh, getting, getting infected. Um, so you'll recall the structure of these models. This is an SIR model. And uh, here we have those factors, including beta and C here, um, affecting incidence. But you'll notice that, uh, that ultimately incidence, these kind of people per unit time that are infected is affected by susceptible and infected in this uh, fashion that ends up being multiplicative. Now, we're dealing with simplified models here. Uh, and indeed, this model, the SIR model, goes back to about 1927 um, with the work of Kermit McKendrick with ancestors of it in malaria going back to about 1916. So it's a venerable model, uh, but there've been countless elaborations on it. Um, and one of the most popular of these is the so-called SEIR model. And I need to introduce this to you because not only is it highly relevant for COVID-19, it's, it's also generally somewhat more applicable than this SIR model in its pure form. And uh, compared to the SIR model, what distinguishes this is that we have a fourth compartment in addition to the three characteristic of S, I, and R. We have an exposed or exposure compartment. It would be best labeled uh, exposed. Um, and this is a state which is commonly termed, where people are commonly termed being latently infected. They're infected, but they're not yet infective or in, in, uh, infectious. Uh, they, they carry the infection, but they're not gonna pass it on to someone else. And generally the dynamics of uh, things like viral infections is such, there's a certain period where the virus has to build up a, a certain level in your body, incidentally well characterized by compartments, compartmental models of its own. Um, and during that time, you generally have a viral load level that's too small to, to spread it, for example. Um, and for certain other types of pathogens, there can be similar phenomena. So there's often this delay associated with becoming infectious after you're infected that makes a real difference in how the infection spreads. For COVID-19, it makes a huge difference. And uh, if you go and look at the literature, there's a wide literature that can inform these sorts of models with things like the, the so-called latent period, that's uh, how long they're in this state. There's the incubation period, how long it is from someone becoming infected to when they show symptoms. So this is more when they show symptoms, this is when they become infectious, and then how long they, they remain infectious. Uh, this is in days uh, for a variety of, of common infections. Uh, this is from this uh, great book, Infectious Diseases of Humans by Anderson and May, that kind of is the Bible of its, uh, of its genre. So uh, the key term here, of course, is this uh, new infection term. Um, and uh, here we have this uh, S times force of infection or S times this term that represents the force of infection. C representing the fact that a person has a certain number of contacts with anyone per day times I over N reflecting the fact that only a fraction of those I over N are likely to be with infectious people. And then times beta, which lends an approximation to, to uh, overall uh, what's by chance of, of uh, transmitting to, to anyone, okay? Um, and uh, this, uh, this is the number of susceptibles infected per unit time, regardless of whether we're in a SEIR model or an SIR model. Um, and I argued that another very fruitful way to view this uh, that we talked about last time and which we'll draw on later in this lecture concerns rearranging, it, it comes about by rearranging this formula. Uh, it's simply trading places of I bringing it out and S bringing it in, taking advantage of commutivity of, of multiplication of real numbers there. And uh, basically, this turns it around from being 
a formula focused on susceptibles as it was here, where we consider what's the chance that a given susceptible will get infected in the next little bit of time, say day, to something focusing on infectives. And here we have number of infectives. And this term uh, that, that multiplies by it uh, is something that represents the number of susceptibles infected per unit time by each infective. After all, each infective has contact with C people overall, less times I over N of them uh, is the fraction of them that are infected. So C times S over N is number of susceptibles with whom they have in, that they come into contact per unit time. And for each of those people, that infective has a beta chance of transmitting. Um, and uh, so here, we, we have an infectious centric view. And what it brings home is the fact that if we call S over N, F, the fraction that are susceptible, the lower and lower that fraction is, the more and more hard it is for that infective to find someone to infect. So there's less fuel for the fire that's already burning, less fuel for those flames. And it will tend to reduce the burning rate um, and in a quite linear way. Uh, so it, it, it constrains things. So the critical throttle here is the fraction of the, that are susceptible. That is going to be the, going to represent how much fuel there is for the fire. The larger it is, the more raging will be that fire. And we talked about the effective reproductive number, the number of people infective, infected by a given infective uh, over the course of their infection, their entire length of infection. Uh, and we talked about the basic reproductive number, which is the effective reproductive number in the very special case that everyone around them is susceptible. And it's kind of a worst case. And as we saw earlier for parameters, um, there's been generations of epidemiologists and mathematical epidemiologists who mathematicians who have worked to derive estimates for uh, the basic reproductive number in various contexts for various diseases. The key thing is it is context specific. It's not only dependent on the characteristics of a, of a given pathogen, a given type of, um, of a communicable bug, um, because uh, it does depend in general on C, uh, the chance per unit time. It depends on beta on um, the chance of transmission. If we're dealing with a situation with very little running water, for example, in, um, in very poor areas of developing countries, we may have a, a beta that is quite high for a sort of surface uh, contaminated disease. Whereas if you're dealing with a, a situation with good sanitation, it may be lower. But you could see a variety of, of um, estimates of the basic reproductive number for, for various, uh, uh, various common illnesses here. For COVID-19, uh, there's good reason to believe in Saskatchewan with the conventional strain. Uh, the COVID-19 basic reproductive number is between three and four. In our north, it's upwards of six due to uh, housing crowding uh, and uh, limited ventilation in those houses um, uh, because of the um, you know real issues with with equity when it comes to housing issues. Uh, so and with newer strains, uh, with the the UK strain, the basic reproductive number for COVID nineteen with the UK strain is about fifty percent higher than it is with the normal strain. So it's about 50% more transmissible. Okay, um, so we talked about the, the, the susceptible fraction and here, uh, the key point here is look, um, this is the throttle that, that um, shuts off the ability for the infection to spread effectively or, or allows it to spread. Uh, and it's this, throttle that determines equilibrium. In an equilibrium state, number of infectives is not changing. And so the inflow has to equal the outflow or equally much so 
one infective has to infect one person before they recover. They're just replacing themselves rather than doubling themselves or, or quadrupling themselves. Uh, you can only imagine what it would be for something like measles, where you might have a basic reproductive number of 16, for example. Um, so here, uh, the, the susceptible fraction is going to limit the ability to which an infective will be able to find more than one person to, to replace himself with. And we introduced last time, very quickly, a diagrammatic mechanism for, uh, for, for reasoning about the dynamics of models that went beyond the classic time value over time graph. We've been dealing with these sorts of graphs for most of our, most of our discussions. Uh, they illustrate over time the, how values of different uh, variables in the system, uh, various uh, endogenous quantities, quantities computed by the system change. And we uh, derived a certain amount of insight by seeing these, for example, seeing this characteristic rise and fall with infectives. But in looking at state space, we, we applied a different lens, a lens that is in some sense orthogonal to that value over time lens. Value over time, time is one axis. In a state space lens, we don't even show time explicitly. In a value over time lens, the y-axis shows the value for different variables. Here, they form the basic x, y, and z axes associated with, with these diagrams. And uh, within this context, we're going to be watching a system's evolution as a trajectory for a given set of parameters. So at any one time, the system will be in a certain point here in state space as we call it. We call it state space because it completely characterizes its location, the number of susceptibles, the number of infectives, and the number of immune people. And that state will change over time. And that will allow the system to proceed along this trajectory. Time is merely implicit here. In some areas of this trajectory, it may go quicker. In some areas, it may stagnate but it's proceeding along the trajectory in a, in a certain direction, okay? Um, and this trajectory uh, will often have a certain structure that suggests kind of the evolution of the system as it applies to multiple, uh, to multiple uh, aspects of the, uh, uh, of the system state over time, ideally all aspects. Now, we can go beyond a simple diagram like this uh, with one trajectory to show things like uh, vector fields. And this gives a sense of if you started here, for example, where would you end up? Not just for the particular trajectory shown, but for other points as well. Uh, now, as I emphasize, these figures are specific to a set of parameters. And we may show you know, different ones for different sets of parameters. For example, if our parameters are such that we, we have a unstable situation, if the infection catches, it will spread uh, widely, then we may have a certain number of susceptibles and very few infectives. So we start down here and we proceed up here with fewer and fewer infectives being left, more and more infectives. And we eventually turn the corner where we're no longer gaining infectives, but we're still losing susceptibles and we come down to a state with few susceptibles and few infectives. That's where the fire has consumed the wood, the fire's gone, most of the unburned wood is, is used up, is gone, and uh, we're in a state which is now stable, much, much like it is in the fireplace. By contrast, if we had a different situation where the infection declines immediately, um, where it's stable from the get-go, we might start with uh, 1,500 susceptibles and one infective, but it quickly damps down to a situation where we do have fewer infectives. Maybe it catches a few people, but it peters out quickly. Those people on average won't even infect one person before they recover. So by chance, we'll infect a few, but it will die down. 
Okay, so under what conditions do each of these two um, situations apply? Well, look, uh, I is going to decline from the get-go if the outflow rate is greater than the inflow, right? If the rate at which people are recovering is greater than the rate at which they're getting affected, speaking about rate as people per unit time, um, we could simply do the math if we have a situation with a closed population where recoveds are given by I over some mean time infective mu and where the number of new infections is given by this classic equation that we, we spoke about before. Uh, and what we're going to find by rearranging terms here is that uh, the, the infection will decline in situations where outflow is greater than inflow, which is given by exactly this situation. C times beta times mu. So the contact rate times the probability transmission per discordant contact times, the length of time someone stays infective, times this fraction susceptible is less than one. So if we're all susceptible at the start, essentially S equals N, maybe there's one infective out of a million, but it's basically, you know, 999,999 out of a million, good enough, close to one. Uh, essentially, we have C times beta times mu less than one. What C times beta times mu in a simple model, this quantity has meaning. What is the name of that quantity? Anyone speak up? C times beta times mu has a name. I uttered the name in the past few minutes. What is it? The basic reproductive number. It's the basic reproductive number. And S times S divided by N times it is the effective reproductive number. So what this is saying is, look, it's going to go down when each infective infects on average less than one person before they recover. Um, okay. Now I'd like to go. And so that was by way of some reminders, but concentrating on some things we, we went over quickly last time and, and bring out a few additional aspects like this SEIR model. Let's talk about equilibria, also something we touched on last time. So imagine we, we have a system where uh, we have some inflow, we have some infection taking place, and then we have some recovery taking place. This is a closed population. There's no one coming, excuse me, M, uh, we're gonna deal with a closed population where M is zero for now. And we'll open that case of an open population in a few minutes. So here we have a closed population, okay? Um, and we're going to be, uh, excuse me, a closed population where we have infection occurring and recovery occurring. And we're going to focus on understanding the equilibria from this. Now, in order to analyze this and watch this for the sake of um, your, your take home exercise, we're gonna go through a set of simplifications. First of all, we can note that the entire population here is either susceptible, infected, or recovering, okay? In this case, nobody's coming in. So we have a, a total population N that's fixed. So S plus I plus R equals N. So if we know S and I, we know what R is. Um, R is just N minus S minus I, okay? so. By, by extension, uh, if we're looking at the derivatives of this over time, uh, the derivative of R dt, the, how quickly R is going up is just how quickly N is going up minus how quickly S is going up, how quickly I is going up. Now we want to find when it's in balance. And when it's in balance, when S and I are in balance aren't changing, S dot and I dot will be zero the rate of change of each will be zero. N dot is the total population. It's not changing at all. So R dot is gonna be equal to zero. So all we have to do is find this case of S and I not changing, not going up, not going down. And since R is the rest of the population, that will have to be fixed as well. Okay, so how are we gonna find it? Well, here we have our equations. We just have to solve them. What are we gonna solve it for? We're gonna solve it, ladies and gentlemen, for S and I. We're gonna solve it for values of S and I where this system 
is is in equilibrium okay and that's going to be some s is going to have some formula of constants in these parameters and same thing for i it's going to be some formula of constants and parameters so when is this thing in balance well it's going to be a balance well when both these things are equal to zero so we know it's in balance when this thing uh, it this thing has to be equal to zero and gosh if this thing is equal to zero then it must be that just get rid of the minus sign and divide by minus, or you know, multiply by minus one on both sides, right? This thing is equal to zero. And look, we, we know that I equals that same thing minus this. And so if this thing is zero, then, then, then we know that thing minus I over tau has to equal zero as well. Um, this whole thing has to equal zero. If this does, and then it tells us that I over tau equals zero. So what this is telling us is, look, I has to equal zero. For this thing to be in balance, for this to be true, there's no way, no two ways about it. I has to be equal to zero, okay? Um, uh, you could have S equal to zero. It's gonna make these two terms zero, but unless I is zero, this is not gonna be, be zero. And uh, you know, the only way for this term for this term to be zero is if this one is as well. So I equals zero. So basically anytime we have no infectives, the system's gonna be in balance. Even if you know we have only R being half the population and S being half the population, if there's no infectives, uh, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be moving. It's it's going to be in an equilibrium. So for this closed model, it's particularly simple any state with zero infectives is in equilibrium um now that doesn't say all those states are stable it's just going to be in balance whether or not it's a stable balance uh remains to be seen and we'll talk about that some next time um okay but the more interesting case is with populations that are not simply closed and you know, one way where it simply goes uh, S through R. And we're gonna consider two cases here. And for the exercise, you're gonna examine the second one in more detail. The first of them has a circulating population. So here we have a population that um, has these same compartments S, I, and R, but where people go back from from the recovered state to the susceptible state. People lose immunity. We talk about immunity waning. And this too, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately is a feature of COVID-19. There's reason to believe that uh, natural in protection against COVID-19 from earlier infection, that's what we, we call natural, uh, might la probably last somewhat less than a year. Um, uh, maybe up up to a year, um, you know, uh, and uh, for vaccine induced immunity, well, there's some uh, uncertainties about how long that is that are quite broad. Uh, now, there's many reasons for that that I won't go into today. Uh, some of them have to do with the mutating nature of it, but uh, it has to do with immunological dynamics, which is a beautiful area of mathematical modeling uh, in infectious diseases and one to which we've contributed. Um, the key factors though here um, are such that people leave the recovered state and go back to the susceptible state um, over time. And there's a certain rate, which we'll call omega, by which that happens, okay? So there's a certain chance per unit time, say per month, uh, there's a certain chance a point of 10% that someone loses their immunity and becomes susceptible again, okay? So what goes out of R comes back into S and there's this kind of recirculation through the system. Now this totally changes the dynamics because no longer is it the case that susceptibles just decline monotonically. It just declines and, and uh, you know, goes, goes lower and lower and Perhaps at some point there's no infectives and, uh, or at, at some point if you were to eliminate infectives for some reason, 
So this stuff tells to remain constant. It's not, it's not like that. Now we have people losing their immunity, becoming susceptible again. Okay, so in order to solve this, mark my words for the exercise, you're going to be going through and simplifying this by the same principle as before. You say, oh, look, S, I, and R are the entire population. There's nobody else in the model. There's nobody coming in. There's nobody leaving. So S plus I plus R must equal N, and R must be N minus S minus I. So if we know the values of S and I at equilibrium, we know R. And if S and I are in equilibrium, are not changing, R must not be changing. So we, we observe that R equals S minus L, uh, R, N minus S minus I. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna solve, having sort of uh, assured ourselves that we can solve for R once we get S and I, um, and that R, uh, S and I not changing means R not changing, we could just set S and I be equal to zero. We can, in other words, determine the situation which they're equal to zero. So here we have uh, S uh, just expanded. So I'm, I'm expanding uh, R here in this sort of way. R is simply N minus S minus I. So I'm substituting that in here. And, uh, and that allows us to now work without referring to R at all. We don't have to refer to R. We, we just use this instead. Okay, so how are we gonna solve this thing uh, for equilibrium? Well, gosh, if students remember this every year in the final exam, the final exam marks, well, it'd be a lot more fun for me to mark the final exam, a lot more uplifting. Um, so uh, here, we need to solve it for equilibrium. So for it to be an equilibrium, S dot equals I dot equals zero. In other words, S can't be changing and I can't be changing. Both have to be equal to zero. So we want these things to equal zero and that's gonna imply a, a R equals zero. Okay, uh, that change, rate of change of R is, is zero. Okay, so we have to start somewhere. Where are we gonna start? Well, let's, Let's kind of look at this and eyeball it and say, well, look, um, let's start with this one. This one looks a little bit, it has fewer terms in it. It looks a little bit nicer. And, oh, look at that. I is in both of these. Oh, that maybe that's gonna allow me to factor it, right? Oh yeah, okay. So, so we can pull I out and then we've got this, right? I times that. Um, now, where did this come from? Well, look, I, to simplify, I just multiplied everything by n. Zero times n is zero. Um, and this became minus i n. Factoring out the i, it was this minus n. And, and it got rid of the fractions here, which are pesky things um, to deal with. So, so I, I get rid of fractions. And look, OK, so i is the rate of change of i is going to be equal to zero. i is not going to be going up or down. Um, it's going to be staying the same. In other words, I dot equals zero in this case, if this is the case. Now, this could be true for two different reasons, right? One reason it could be true is what? What's one reason this could be true, that I times this thing equals zero, if what is true? What sort of obvious I factor? Is zero. I is zero. Yeah, I is zero. The other case would be if what? The inflows and outflows are zero. Basically, that second term is zero. The second term is zero. That's right. So one way or the other, we've got to have either this being zero or this being zero or both, right? Um, so, so we'll take the two cases. OK, first case, i equals zero. That's kind of the easy one, right? Um, so uh, if you think about it, with, with i being zero, um, uh, we can got to go back to this and say, gosh, if, if i equals zero, certainly this is going to be zero. Well, yeah, that's where that came from. But if i is zero, this whole term goes away, right? And this term goes away. And then we are just going to have omega times n minus s equals zero. I, I, I put it out here, right here. This term went away, this term went away. And so, well, look, if omega, if this rate of change, this the chance for unit time of losing immunity 
is not equal to zero. I mean, if we're equal to zero, we're back to the SIR model, the classic SIR model. So let's assume it's, it's not equal to zero, right? Um, that's why we build this model. If we want to look at people losing immunity, which by automatically means omega is not equal to zero. And, and the only way this is gonna, this time set is gonna equal zero, omega times n minus s equals zero is if n minus s is zero, and if n minus s equals zero, it tells us s has got to be equal to n. So what is that telling us? If s equals n, what does that mean? Like big picture, what does that mean? Everyone's susceptible. Everyone's susceptible. No one's recovered. No one's effective, right? Everyone's susceptible. That's one way this thing could be at equilibrium. Yeah, that's called a disease-free equilibrium. Everyone is susceptible. Now, as we'll see next time, a key question is, is it stable? Because we want it to be stable, right? COVID-19, two years from now, three years from now, we want, even if, even if all persons were susceptible, we don't want the infection to be able to spread. So, so we want it to be in a stable state. Uh, this doesn't say that, but it, it does say, that it's in balance when S equals M, fair enough. Two years ago, we were in balance, right? <laughs> With respect to COVID-19, everyone was susceptible. This was the situation two years ago. Remember that? Yeah, so do I. Um, so, um, so here's case two, okay? The case two is I is not equal to zero. Now, if I is not equal to zero, hey, then we, we could simplify this, divide by i on both sides, right? And then we get this thing, just like was said earlier, uh, equals zero. Okay, if this thing equals zero, then just rearrange the terms. Remember, we're solving for s, i, and eventually r, right? That's what we're trying to do here. We're solving for them where s dot equals i dot equals r dot equals zero. We're solving under what values of s, i, and r, is the system in balance? Is the system not changing? Is the system uh, in a, a stasis? So in this case, we're solving for S and we get S equals N over C beta tau. Anyone recognize that C beta tau? I called it tau here instead of mu, but it's it's just our old friend and another guys. What is this? It's a basic, basic reproductive it's a number. basic reproductive number. Yeah, in the endemic equilibrium, guess what? the fraction of the population that's susceptible is one over the basic reproductive number, which makes sense because that allows each infective to infect how many people before they recover? One. One, one, one. that's why it's in balance. It, it, it's not growing, it's not spreading. They're replacing themselves with one person. That's the fraction of the population that is in is susceptible to put it in balance. So, because remember, normally an infective infects how many people before they recover? If the total, if 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 the population is all susceptible, how many people do they infect before they recover? The what? The basic reproductive. Basic number. reproductive number. Thank you. Thank you. Which is C beta tau here. Yeah, so if they're surrounded by susceptibles, they'll infect basic reproductive number. But if they're only surrounded by a group of people who are one basic reproductive number uh, of them are, are susceptible, they'll infect the basic reproductive number times one over the basic reproductive number or one person before they recover. Hmm. Um, so, so that's why that has to be the case. It, it evidently its beauty is seems stronger to me than to you, but but perhaps you're all swooned in your chairs and um, unable to utter make utterances due to your your uh, vision of, of of beauty and the epiphany which is upon you. Um, so. Uh, but we need to go more than this. This is solving for S. Now, do we, what do we need to solve for? We're, 
Well, we're going to need to solve for i. This whole formula here came out of uh, i dot, right? That's, that's where this came from. So we've just solved using i dot, we solve for s. And now we've got to take advantage of the other information we know, which is s dot equals zero. We solved i dot equals zero. That's what gave us this. And, and it gave us this understanding of s. To solve for i, we need to we need to use the other piece of information that we're given, s dot equals zero. Okay, this was s dot, remember that? Okay, so all we do is we substitute into that, this is the formula for s dot, and we saw it earlier, this one right there. Okay, so it's time to go back to the salt mines, right? We, we, gotta, we gotta plug in uh, uh, the formula for s that we got for s, into this to get the formula for i. So, so here we got to plug it in for s. There we are. We're, we've got two s's where we'll plug it in. Okay, great. So plug it in there. I probably could have done better by rearranging things. We plug it in and we multiply by the pesky, pesky fractions. So we 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 get rid of the fractions here by multiplying both sides. And basically, this is what we get by rearranging terms. And I've kind of shown where, where terms come from. Oh, come on, Zoom. You can do better than that. Um, I, I dare not bring the mouse down there. But uh, down in the lower left, you, um, uh, you, you have uh, a, uh, a set of terms. Everything except for the i's are on the left. And all the i terms are on the right. I just group things around, right? Because uh, we're solving for i. And then we invert and uh, we will get this sort of uh, uh, this sort of formula. So I'm gonna put this all together. Here i is not equal to zero. Um, and, and we got this and, and really to divide through, we'll, we'll kind of uh, have to assume that C beta tau times this thing is greater than zero, which makes sense because all of uh, beta, C, tau, omega are all greater, greater than or equal to zero. It, there's kind of pointless to simulate this if C is zero, people don't meet, or beta is zero, people don't communicate disease if they do meet, or tau is zero, people instantly recover, or uh, omega is zero, that's just the normal SIR model. So so here we can divide through by this and we, we get this uh, rather pleasing formula. So here we go. S, I, and R, we, I, I solve for R being N minus S minus I. And, and this is what you get, okay? Um, uh, this is uh, out front, a fraction of the population that's susceptible. Um, and that's why it's it's one here to multiply by s is n over c times beta times tau. Now i and r have this interesting relationship. i is just omega t times r, and I want to comment on a couple of features of this. First of all, c beta tau it is the basic reproductive number in equilibrium. Remember, this is equilibrium. This is not disease-free equilibrium. This is endemic equilibrium. The bug is staying in the population. And it's in the population, but it's in stasis uh, with a certain number of, of uh, infectives, a certain number of recovered, and a certain number of susceptibles that is all in balance. OK? Uh, and in that stasis, we have this fraction that are susceptible of one over basic reproductive number of the population, okay? We also have a certain fraction that remain infectious, which uh, uses this quantity here. Now, the interesting thing is C times beta times tau. If we use this convention where C is, okay, C is the contact rate. So people mixed with, mixed with per person susceptible in the, in the population per unit time. So it's, it's a dimension one over time. Then uh, if you think about it, C times beta times tau is dimensionless. It's one of these, these it has, it's invariant of units. It doesn't matter what units you wanna measure time in, for example. 
uh, as long as you're consistent, you measure duration of recovery in the same time unit you use as, as, as quantifying the contact rate. That's a dimensionless quantity here. And it turns out omega tau is also dimensionless. Um, it's rather pleasing, is it not? Um, I won't wait for the response. Uh, so here we have uh, we have uh, this this term here, which represents the fraction that are recovered, and the fraction that are infective is just omega t times it, which stands to reason uh, here. If we have a longer time, people are sick. So tau is long. This is this is how long they're sick for. Remember, these were the original equations. Tau is the length of time they're sick, um, then that's going to lead there to be more people ill in the endemic equilibrium. Alternatively, and, and this is interesting, um, if you have a higher waning rate, omega, you will tend to have more people infectious at any time, a greater fraction, uh, fraction infectious. And the ratio of infectious people to recovered is always omega tau. And that kind of makes sense, right? If you have a very high omega, people quickly leave the recovered state and they go back to susceptible. And so as omega gets larger and larger, those people who are not susceptible are disproportionately in the infective state. They're, the recovereds are, are fewer and fewer because they're getting recycled back to susceptible sooner and sooner. So from both these perspectives, you have this preponderance of people uh, as tau goes up and omega goes up that are in the infectious state. Um, and uh, compared to the susceptible state, well, it's, it's governed by uh, these ratios uh, here, the C times beta. So this is basically reproductive number minus one over omega tau plus one. Um, now, if basic reproductive number is, is zero, it's useful to often interpret this under extreme cases. If basic reproductive number were one, what, what happens, ladies and gentlemen, if basic reproductive number is less than one? What, what's gonna happen to the infection immediately? If the basic out. reproductive number is less than it one- It dies out? It dies out immediately. It's not gonna spread there ain't gonna be an, uh, an endemic equilibrium. So this all, all hell breaks loose in these formulas, right? If it's less than one, because there isn't an endemic equilibrium. If it's exactly equal to one, basically also there's gonna be no infectives and no susceptibles. It's just gonna be everyone staying, staying uh, infective. It's gonna be N over one times well, it's, it's going to be N being susceptible as everyone else is going to be zero. By contrast, if we think of C beta tau growing, 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 um, uh, we think of, of uh, these ratios here, um, it may be useful. So if, if, if R zero, if, if the basic reproductive number is getting larger and larger and larger, this numerator, uh, over this denominator will be dominated by C beta tau over omega tau. The, the minus one and the plus one. I mean, that's small potatoes if C beta tau is 30 or something like that, right? Um, uh, so, so basically it's gonna be C beta over, over gamma, uh, sorry, gamma over omega. Um, and uh, you gotta watch your omegas and gammas. Um, so C beta over gamma uh, is going to be it's going to approach that, that limit. And this is gonna be C beta over gamma, that gamma is gonna cancel. So it's gonna approach C beta tau, interestingly, uh, of uh, it's going to approach C beta tau as the fraction that are infectious at any one time. Uh, and and uh, this is going to be still one, um, well, uh, excuse me, that's gonna be that term and then C beta tau times this. So basically everyone's gonna be infectious because this is going to reduce. All of these terms will reduce to C beta tau, which is gonna multiply by this C beta tau. So basically everyone will be infectious 
uh, except for a very small fraction of one over the basic reproductive number of the population, which remains susceptible. Um, and you, you can go through similar exercises, you know, as you vary, for example, um, uh, the the omega specifically. Um, so, so, so this um, characterization is of endemic equilibrium. Uh, it's it's dealing with the situation where the bug is uh, staying in the population, and uh, specifically, you know, asking how is it divided up that it's in balance. Um, if omega is zero, by the way, if omega is zero, what happens here? Well, if omega is zero, the endemic equilibria has how many people infected? Anyone? If omega is zero, if there's no one losing, if there's no loss of immunity over time, what fraction of the population for endemic equilibrium remains infected? Zero. 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 Yeah, zero. Um, uh, and what fraction of the population remains remains uh, recovered. Well, it's not zero. Is it zero? No, right? Because uh, you've got omega tau going to zero. So you've got one down here. And so you have C beta tau minus one up up, up at the, the top, right? Um, and uh, this is zero. Uh, it's going to be one here, C beta tau minus one there, zero here. They're going to sum up to C beta tau. Um, and so uh, essentially, whoa, um, uh, one, one C beta tau of the population will, will remain susceptible and the balance of them, one minus that will remain, will be recovered at the end. Okay, so, so this is a circulating population. Um, any questions about that before I go on to this open population and then I dive into the, the key dynamics component? Any questions on how I solve that? Any questions about this solution? Going once. Going twice, gone. Okay, um, office hours will fall. Okay, let's talk about an open population. Um, uh, the question here is how and why would introduction of birth and death uh, affect behavior? Well, you tell me, compared to the closed case where the infection burns through, nobody is left infective. Um, in the asymptote, in the eventual situation. Everyone um, is either recovered or, or susceptible. Some people may be recovered. Some people remain susceptible. Mark my words, students get that. Oh my gosh. Every final exam I ask, I emphasize the point during class and it's like lemmings, it, it just, they, People think everyone's like all the fire, the fuel in the fire is burned through. It's not. If you have a fireplace and you have wood there, not all the wood gets burnt um, in the end. It's, it's, it's only fractions of the wood, unless you're very careful in tending to it, to mix it, mix it, mix it constantly. Um, otherwise, it will just burn through, you know, from perhaps campsites. Uh, how would introducing uh, birth and death affect behavior? Of, of a system. How do you think it would change this? If, if there are no infectives, then uh, the number of recovered will slowly decline and the number of susceptibles will increase. Okay, so yeah, if we have population turnover, um, we will have, it'll be like bringing fuel to the fire over time. So it will keep the infectives going, it keep infection going, and it will replenish the susceptibles, right, as people come in. 
Um, the desks will be leaving, but uh, there'll be you know, people coming in who are susceptible and recovereds will be leaving as well. So you'll have a chance at having a, a replenishment of what fraction of the people around uh, are, are, are susceptible. Um, and you know, the question here is how will it change long-term behavior? Under what condition would the stock of susceptibles, for example, be declining? Under what condition would it be, would the stock of infectives be, be declining? Well, I've asked, uh, I've asked to look at this in two ways. One is through equilibria, and one is by looking at the dynamics over time. And we're gonna be doing uh, both of these as a class, but you're gonna be struggling with the first of the equilibria case using the patterns we saw for the closed and especially the cycling population. Uh, you can look at the open population for the take-home exercise. So here we're going to essentially have and for the take home exercise, we have the simplifying case where people are leaving with the same chance per unit time as people are coming in. And this will allow you to assume that S plus I plus R is N, okay? Because uh, while people are leaving, people are coming in to replenish them at the same rate. So the total population size will stay constant. And we're going to see that this fundamentally alters the behavior. Where we, when we had a closed population, <clears throat> we had this situation where if the basically reproductive number is less than one, um, uh, basically everyone stays, everyone stays uh, susceptible. Um, and uh, virtually no one becomes infected. Um, uh, by contrast, if uh, the basic reproductive number is, is greater than one, the fraction that remains susceptible um, will be greater than zero. It, it, some people remain. Uh, the fraction that remain infective at the end though, will be zero. I mean, it, it'll, it'll go arbitrarily low over, over time. So with a closed population, the, the fire will die out. If you have, all you have is a fixed set of fuel, it will die out. By contrast, if you have an open population or a circulating population, uh, and we look at those two cases, um, uh, we'll have somewhat different outcomes. The outcomes are the same for the case of uh, the basic reproductive number less than one, it's not gonna spread. But basic reproductive number greater than one, as we've already seen, one over the basic reproductive number of the population remains susceptible. And, and that's so that the system is in balance. Um, now the balance will be a bit different if people are dying uh, or leaving the population through migration than if, um, if it's strictly through, through circulation. Um, but the fraction infective will be such that infection rate equals recovery rate. The number of new people coming in to infectives has got to equal the number going out, okay? Um, so we're gonna have dynamics that look like this. This is notable. And what's really interesting here is that you have these oscillations and these oscillations are real phenomena. They are characteristic phenomena seen in infectious diseases worldwide particularly endemic infectious diseases. I've shown it here for birth and death, but these uh, same sort of oscillations apply for the case of a circulating population. Um, so here we have blue being susceptibles, red being infectives, and a force of infection is shown, shown as green. You can focus most of your attention on the red and the blue. Now with a closed population, we also had the, the susceptibles plummeting at, at the beginning time, as you see here. What's different here about the, the curve of susceptibles can, compared to the case of the closed population? Anyone, what's the most obvious difference? It decreases, but it rises again. It decreases, but then it rises. Right, um, Ernest Hemingway could have written, you know, the the susceptibles also rise, um, and the the infectives uh, rise, come down, 
But what's different there? They too rise, right? Uh, they too rise later and they end up oscillating. So I, I have some puzzles for you. Okay, first of all, let's, let's get some basic understanding. I wanna give you some puzzles to, to sort of grapple with. Number one, um, I wanna observe a few factoids, okay? So factoid one, when infectives peak, this is, we know from earlier, this is characterized by two equally true observations. The first is the rate of recoveries has to be equal to the rate of, of new infections. So the rate of people leaving the infective stock in general, recoveries and deaths uh, has got to, or, or migrations, has got to be equal to the number coming in. That's, that's got to be true for the effective stock not to be going up or not to be going down. Basic fact of stocks, right? The other thing is each person infects on average one person before recovery. That's kind of the replacement perspective from an individual perspective. Um, uh, now, that's, that characterizes that peak, right? Um, and I would note that endemically out here, the fraction of susceptibles that apply, the fraction of the population that is susceptible, as you consider the long-term behavior, has got to be such that it's in endemic equilibrium. And that fraction is one over the what? This is getting really basic painful. Reproductive. Basic, yeah, reproductive. basic reproductive number. Yeah, it's over the base one over the basic reproductive number. It's it's at that point that each infective will not infect basic reproductive number number of people before they recover, but rather basic reproductive number times one over the basic reproductive number of one person before they recover. So that much we we know, but. Um, there's some dynamics associated with that. If, if above that fraction of susceptibles, help me understand, there's a feedback that applies here. Above that fraction of susceptibles, let's suppose we were to bump it up. We were to bump the number, the fraction that are susceptible up by, you know, flying in boatload, flying in, flo flying in, you know, um, uh, cargo transporters worth of people. Um, of susceptible people at this time. What would happen if we flew in tons and tons of susceptibles uh, at this point uh, late in the game? What's gonna happen? New wave of infection? Yeah, there's a new wave of infection. The number of, uh, so those infections, or those susceptible people will, will swell the number of people around it in a given infective who are susceptible to infection. So they'll infect more than one person by the time they recover. And that will tend to bring down the fraction that are susceptible again. By contrast, if we were to go scoop up the recovered and evacuate them, uh, then, oh, excuse me, I, I should, uh, I should uh, re 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 go back to those remarks because that would also increase the fraction that are susceptible. Um, uh, but if we were to, for example, have tons of recovered people coming in or tons of vaccinated people, as we'll see next time, um, how would that affect things? What would happen then? So if we had a lot fewer people around them who are, who, are, uh, who are susceptible to infection. What's going to happen? Infectives will decrease over yeah. time? Uh, the number of infectives will, will, will decrease and that will tend to infect fewer susceptibles. Um, and we will, we will end up uh, having more people build up who are susceptible. Um, so it'll be, there'll be a buildup of susceptibles on account of the fact that infection becomes less, less uh, effective in transmitting. So by blocking infection, by having 
more and more people around who are immune to infection, essentially we end up building up the number of susceptibles, which restores the balance to a point where each infective infects one susceptible. So that's, that's something about the endemic equilibrium. So above this fracture of susceptibles, the number of infected people will rise. And, uh, and that will tend to bring down the, the um, uh, so by above that fraction of susceptibles, you'll infect more people and therefore the fraction of susceptibles will come down below that. Uh, below that fraction, you'll infect fewer people and therefore the number of susceptibles, um, uh, the number of infective people that get infected over time will, will fall and therefore uh, more susceptibles will build up. Okay, uh, but I wanna ask you some questions about the dynamics here. So you'll notice this, this kind of wave-like form. Uh, why is it that the number of susceptibles is declining even after you have this peak in the number of infectives? Why does the number of susceptibles decline even after that peak, anyone? What's the intuition there? The infectives that remain are still infecting people? Yeah, the infectives are still there. Okay, they're not growing as many, but they're still large in number. Um, and they're still infecting people. And they're infecting enough people that it exceeds, that the outflow exceeds the inflow from susceptibles, right? The inflow from susceptibles might be people being born, for example. Um, and here, the number of infectives around is such that we're infecting enough susceptibles that that uh, their numbers decline because outflow is greater than equal uh, greater than inflow, and at some point though it's going to reach uh, a minimum uh, here where outflow equals inflow from susceptibles. Now you notice susceptible starts replenishing there, and because we have outflow greater than or great or inflow greater than outflow. People are being born, for example, faster than they're getting infected. After all, the number of infectives is, 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 is quite small here. Um, at exactly this point where it reached its minimum inflow equaled outflow. But here, the number of susceptibles is rising because we have more people, people are being born faster than they're being infected. And, and that goes up, but you'll know that it actually goes up to well above its sustainable value. This leads to this kind of waveform. Why does the number of, why does the number of susceptibles and by extension the fraction susceptible uh, go up to well above the point where infection is, 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 uh, is infecting one person before the infective recovers? Why does it go up well above that? Well, inflow is, is greater than outflow here, right? Uh, infectives are starting to rise here. They're starting to rise, but they're not yet at a point where outflow for susceptibles is gonna be greater than, is gonna, gonna equal inflow. So inflow is greater than outflow for, for susceptibles and it's continued to rise. It's setting itself up for a fall. And all of this, highlights the, the feature of delays. It takes a while for infectives to build up. It's a stock. It has to build up over time. And what builds it up is the availability of firewood, right? And so it allows infectives to go up. And that firewood builds up to an unsustainable point because infectives are low and therefore inflow is greater than outflow for susceptibles. These are associated with delays, associated with the stocks of susceptible and, and uh, infectives. So for a while after infectives start declining, they still deplete susceptibles sufficiently for susceptibles to decline, that's that. For a while after susceptibles are rising, uh, infectives will still be declining. And all through that time, susceptibles is rising. And for a while after infectives start rising again, Susceptibles is still gonna rise because inflow equals outflow for susceptibles. 
So it, it rises to a level that's unsustainable, setting up the opportunity for a second wave of infection. Sound familiar? Um, and you will then see another oscillation. So here, you know, we have uh, a few key points. The rise is occurring here because effectives are so low that we have inflow greater than outflow for susceptibles, and so it continues to rise. Um, and we get this characteristic behavior. This, do you remember me mentioning at one point that when you have a negative feedback loop with a delay, you tend to have oscillations? And you saw it with perceived P and P and, and actual position for those pursuing the assignment. Um, delays lead to oscillations. And that's what you have here. Um, you have an oscillation towards an endemic equilibrium. So if we have no birth and death at all, we might have something like this. Susceptibles decline uh, over time. We get a no replenishment of susceptibles. It's just declining, declining. Infectives rise, rise, rise. At some point, infective replace fewer than one person to get, you know, cause less than one person get infective to replace them by the time they recover. And number of infectives plummets, and we end up with fewer susceptibles and, and no eventual uh, infectives. If you have a high birth and death rate, you'll get something more similar to this, where it'll rise, but it'll start coming down. And again, susceptibles will start rising again. Um, here with inflow equal greater than being greater than outflow. And infectives too are, are um, you know, oscillating around uh, associated with this. With a modest birth and death rate, you get something more similar to this. With a very small birth and death rate, there's long periods between the oscillations. It takes a long time to build up that stock of susceptibles. And these peaks, or these cycles will occur, but they'll occur much less frequently. And they'll be uh, build up, build up, build up, and, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a, uh, an oscillatory uh, uh, outbreak and, uh, and it, will, it will oscillate around some, some uh, equilibrium. And here with a very, very small birth and death rate, uh, you can get something where it almost dies out, but it recovers and it goes to a point with very few infectives. Um, how many equilibria here? Well, we have a disease-free equilibrium and we have an endemic equilibrium. And these are the two key equilibrium equilibria that you have to keep in mind for next time, because the goal of vaccination is to eliminate the stability of the endemic equilibrium and make only the disease-free equilibrium, um, sorry, to, to eliminate the stability to, so to, to make the disease-free equilibrium also stable. By making disease-free equilibrium stable, if an infected person comes in, there won't be an outbreak. By making the endemic equilibrium unstable, it will decay and it will come down to a disease-free equilibrium. Um, uh, and uh, we'll take a look at this issue of stability, uh, stability next time. Um, okay, I think we've used up our time today. Um, these same equilibria will come into play a role for your exercise for Thursday. And they reflect the exact mode of our solving for those, uh, for those equations we went through earlier, disease-free equilibrium corresponds to the case of I equals zero. Endemic equilibrium corresponds to the case of I not equal to zero. So really when you're dividing it up into those two possibilities, in one case you're solving the disease-free equilibrium, in another case you're, you're, you're deriving the endemic equilibrium. And both cases will require some algebra. Um, but each of them will yield a different finding. And the disease-free equilibrium, by definition, will have I equals zero. Uh, and uh, S and recovered um, will generally uh, be 
uh, S will typically be non-zero and, and R may or may not be non-zero. Okay, um, so that's all we have time for today. Uh, I look forward to seeing many of you in office hours in about five minutes, uh, but I hope you find this material uh, of help in preparing for Thursday's exercise. I'm working right now to try to get um, the second assignment out uh, within the next week or so uh, and to you for, for your work as well. Uh, that one will include significant elements of agent-based modeling, which is a topic we'll be going on to uh, within another two lectures. Thanks very much and see you in office hours. Take care there.